and to increase speed, you know, to make the VDI a lot more affordable and make it close as close as possible to VDI to desktop, you know, PC experience. So, <coughs> very interesting, interesting company, and uh, they'll be here today, I mean, next week. But today we have StorageCraft. They're one of our backup software partners. And actually, it was uh, China that introduced us to them <laughs> from Palomar Health. And uh, we appreciate that. And we always learn from our customers. And, uh, you know, thank you. And thank you, StorageCraft. It has been a very good experience. There are a few people here from GTC. Brendan is by our. Uh, is our one of our techs. We got uh, Chris Dyer over there. He's our sales director. He's actually from LA. We got Seth Walensky, one of our territory managers. Who do we have? We have over there Alex Alzeda, one of our TMs, and then we have one of our project managers over there, <coughs> Jamie Brock. And oh, sorry, Gabe, forgot about Gabriel Jaja. He's sitting in the back. So welcome. We have people from Palomar Health, uh, from FIS. We have someone all the way from India, actually. Uh, he's one of the FIS team members, you know, and he's visiting for a few days in the U.S. Welcome. Is that your first visit? Yeah. All right. Welcome. How's your English? Let me see. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so are you guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chris, take it over, man. Go for it. All first, right. Tell us why you're better than everybody else <laughs> when it comes to backup. All right. All right. Well, um, let's start by just a quick opening statement. Thank you for um, everybody here physically. Thank you for everybody on the webinar uh, joining us here today. Um, what we are going to be showing you is a little bit of Shadow Protect and our uh, backup and disaster recovery software. Now, I actually have a couple of backups um, running currently on machines. Uh, virtual machines that I have loaded on my system right now. So um, while those are finishing up, what I want to do is just take a quick second um, to tell you guys a couple of things about StorageCraft um, and Shadow Protect as a product. I uh, won't bore you guys to death with PowerPoint and some of this, uh, some of this information, but I do does give me a chance to kind of give us a little intro as to who we are. And the reason we do that is because what we find is a lot of people are not aware of StorageCraft for one reason or another, or Shadow Protect. And what we find is once we start opening up some of the information about kind of our background and where we've come from, oh yeah, it starts to ring a bell with people. And uh, one, of the, one of the things we start off with is telling you folks about some of the OEM partnerships that we developed um, uh, within the channel. So, whoops, that slide didn't show very well. So within the channel, we have, uh, we are a channel exclusive company and we have developed um, our snapshot technology back in the late 90s. And the snapshot uh, technology that we have developed was, in, was actually developed and in use back uh, at PowerQuest. And you folks may remember that name. They were the makers of some products like Disk Commander, um, Server Magic, Partition Magic, etc. Uh, those, our five founders came from PowerQuest. PowerQuest was bought out by Symantec in uh, 1998. And our owners decided to uh, not participate in that merger and acquisition and actually start StorageCraft. The reason I bring this up again, some of the partnerships you see listed on the screen, is how this company got started. We actually um, started as a reseller of our snapshot technology. So we resold this snapshot driver to some of the folks you see listed on the screen. Obviously, I like to, uh, to point out some of the 600-pound gorillas in the IT world, if you will, like VMware. Um, VMware uses a portion of our snapshot technology when they do a physical to virtual migration of a server. So unbeknownst to a lot of folks out there, um, if you've ever done any kind of technology like that where you've taken a physical server and migrated it to a virtual server using VMware's tool set, you've actually used a portion of our technology. Okay? Now that's uh, obviously just a small snap of, of what our technology really is. Um, Datto Backup, as an example, is a product that they have built an entire business model out of our technology. So different uses throughout the industry, but our technology has been widely used and widely adopted. In 2004 was when we actually decided to put a box around the product and actually start selling it. So um, I'll just bring this slide up real quick because it really does talk about the four components that StorageCraft offers in a business continuity and disaster recovery solution. Uh, not spending, again, a ton of time on this slide, on the far left we talk about our flagship product, which is Shadow Protect. 
it's an imaging product, folks. So we are not backing up files and folders. We're backing up sectors on the local hard drive. And as those sectors change, we grab those sector differences. So unlike file and folder level backups, we're grabbing the entire image of that hard drive, including the operating system, all of its configuration settings, et cetera. Now, there is a, a, a bit of a misconception out in the industry that with imaging backup technology that in order to restore a single file or folder out of that backup, you have to restore the entire image, and that is not the case. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, how quickly we can restore files and folders from a backup here in just minutes. Um, so we give you some great tools uh, in regards to the Shadow Protect backup software. We're allowing you to backup as frequently as every 15 minutes. And um, some of our claims to fame is from that backup, we can actually resurrect your entire server in just a matter of minutes as a virtualized copy. Okay? So from our proprietary files, we have hooks that allow us to resurrect that machine in just minutes. We also, from within the Shadow Protect console, give you the ability to run an image conversion tool. And in short, folks, that takes our proprietary backup files and converts them into a VHD or VMDK file, allowing you to then just uh, moments after that conversion is complete to turn on a copy of your server in either Hyper-V or VMware. Okay? The second uh, portion of this slide as we move over on the top portion here in green image manager, this is really our image handler. And this is a separate component, separate download and install. And um, ironically for its, its standard set of practices, in other words, consolidation, retention and verification of that backup data, Image Manager is free of charge as a product. Okay? Um, Image Manager is also the tool set that is what allows us to take those backups and replicate them off-site to a secondary or tertiary location. Um, we do that replication through a couple of mechanisms that I'm going to talk in more detail about later. Uh, we do have uh, StorageCraft Cloud Services, but we're here today obviously uh, to work with uh, GTC, our go-to and strategic partner in San Diego, and they obviously have their own private cloud offering um, that uh, those folks may discuss with you a little bit today, and if not, please inquire with them in the future because they have a great cloud solution. Um, our fourth component is really our storage craft shadow control CMD, and in short, what this is commonly used for is to manage your, monitor and manage your shadow protect installations in a larger environment. So when you have a large number of nodes, whether you're a StorageCraft reseller or a StorageCraft customer, uh, you're actually going to be able to utilize this monitoring and, and management tool to have a single pane of glass via a web page to manage and monitor all of those uh, Shadow Protect backups. Um, today, this tool set does have uh, uh, monitoring only available to it. We are actually um, releasing that first round of management here within the next uh, a couple of months. Now, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bounce out of this PowerPoint and uh, get back to some of the meat and potatoes and really start showing you the product, as I said, instead of boring you guys to death with PowerPoint slides. Okay, so this is our um, Shadow Protect console. Uh, this console is where we're going to perform the uh, majority of our management tasks when it comes to creating backups and restoring files. Uh, but one thing I like to point out is it's not a requirement. And unlike a lot of our competitors, they do require you to be inside of their proprietary user interface in order to perform any functionality. And with us, uh, we're quite the contrary. We allow you to perform a number of tasks here in this console, but we also um, run a number of other tasks outside of this console with a tool set that can be installed on virtually any computer in your network environment. Um, so we'll talk again a little bit more about this in detail. But in short, what we've got is the ability for this console to be a centralized tool. So you can see that I'm managing a local machine here, which is a highlighted um, laptop. And then I've also got a couple of virtual servers that I have running in the environment that I'm also managing. Um, here in the tabs across the top, you'll notice in square brackets is the name of one of these three machines you see listed below. And if I want to manage one of the other machines, I just simply double click on it or highlight it and hit the connect button and it will go out across the network and actually connect into that machine. And then you will notice as that connection has been established, the tabs across the top here, again in square brackets, are going to change names and it's going to allow us to manage the components specific to that machine. So we can manage the backup jobs, we can manage the disk mapping and the disk allocation, we can manage any destinations that we have set up for these backup jobs to point to, and of course, we can look at all the backup history associated with each one of these machines in detail. 
not only do we get just a synopsis of the backups, but down in the bottom window, we actually get to see the entire backup um, as it's run and what it's actually doing line by line for detail. So it helps our, our uh, IT folks be able to understand what's happening in those backups and ensure everything's successful. Yes? Absolutely. Okay. Go ahead. Two quick ones. You can do physical and virtual server. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. And then when you do your backups, um, is it on a, it's on a per volume basis or can one backup job have multiple volumes? Great, great question. So, so let, let me, let me uh, reiterate the question. Shanna yeah. asked if we can uh, back up physical and virtual servers, and the answer is yes. Um, the one thing I want to point out in regards to some detail on that is we are a guest-based backup utility. So we are not going to back up at the host level and in turn quiesce the VMs. We're actually installed inside of the guest operating system or the virtual machine. Now, that being said, we are a Windows-only uh, um, environment, so we only support Windows machines at the moment, but we do have a Linux version of our product that is going to be released at the end of the first quarter of this year. Okay? Um, so, uh, obviously, if you have a Hyper-V environment, then you can back up the host, but we are not going to recommend that you back up the host exclusively. Um, the host would be an augmentation to backing up those guest VMs. The second question um, was, can you back up a, a volume to volume uh, basis or can you back up all volumes within a, in a job? We do recommend that you back up all volumes inside of the same backup job. And the reason we're going to recommend that is, as an example, with most servers out there, you're, you're typically going to have um, a C drive or an operating system volume that may be on a separate RAID array. And then you're going to have maybe a data volume that might contain your database files. Um, or your, your just simple files in a file server perspective. So if where you've got multiple volumes, we want you to back up all of those volumes at the same time. And the reason being is because it's going to allow us just that much more flexibility when we recover. And, and it, it does bring up a great, a great question and a good segue for me to tell you guys, we are all about recovery. Um, I know that probably sounds fairly obvious, but uh, a backup is no good if you can't recover. And so our focus as an organization has always been on the recovery of that data and providing you a variety of ways to recover not only the data, but the systems as a whole. Well, let's face it, downtime is, is um, money, and, and downtime is what we, we um, focus on mitigating. Um, in fact, we will, again, resurrect a server in just minutes from our proprietary backup file, allowing for that downtime to be minimized as much as possible. That answer your question? Yeah, no problem. Um, like we have a situation where we've got a file server, okay. so C drive obviously would yep. want to back that up, but we've got like 10 other volumes okay. that are just containing files, file okay. shares, okay. and there's a few that we don't want to back up. They've got okay. image files on them, we don't need to back them up, sure. they've been backed up once elsewhere. Great. So we can exclude yeah. those. Right? Yes, great question. Great. You're not required yeah. yes, to back up every You're volume. You're not required just... to back up every volume. We just recommend it if you need to recover those volumes, uh, that we want to include them in a single backup job. Uh, again, as an example, because we will be able to take an Exchange server and boot that entire Exchange server up from our proprietary backup in 10 minutes or less. So obviously, if you're booting the Exchange server C drive only, you're, you're limiting that recovery um, success. But we do talk about, um, um, because we are built upon the VSS framework, there's plenty of customers and partners out there that use VSS in the ways that many of us think about it. Uh, volume shadow copy within Microsoft's native server environment. Uh, where you're doing volume shadow copy snapshots, that's obviously generating change to the disk or the volumes that we're backing up, which in turn can create large incremental backups. So in many cases, what we'll recommend is to take a VSS snapshot within the Microsoft volume shadow copy and store that on a volume that we are not backing up. That way we are not generating these large incrementals based on that volume shadow copy component. So yes, great question. Another prime example of a volume while we're at it that um, in many cases we will recommend not backing up. When working with um, Exchange servers and SQL servers, and in this statement specifically a SQL server, um, with SQL servers in either standard recovery mode or full recovery mode, which are the two ways you can set up a SQL server, we do recommend running a SQL maintenance plan on a daily basis. And one of the reasons we do is because that will flush any queued transactions within that SQL server environment or database and in turn commit the SQL transaction logs. Um, and where you're storing that SQL export or maintenance plan 
is on a volume that in most cases you may not want to back up with Shadow Protect because those can be very large exports and in turn you're storing all of that on, on disk somewhere out on the network. Does that, does that help? Thank you for the great question. Um, so I, I do, um, given that we have a, a short window of time with all of you folks today, I want to uh, um, kind of jump ahead and assume that we all know the basics about image-based backups. Okay? So I'm actually going to show you one last thing. Um, that image conversion tool that I talked about is just simply right here within the Shadow Protect console. Again, as we initiate that, you can see here the wizard will modify an existing backup and add some of these great features to it including converting to a VHD and VMDK. You do it right on the fly that's built into the product and completely free of charge. The caveat with this tool is it is a manual process. So we do not allow you to automate or schedule this for ongoing uh, jobs. So it is something you run on an ad hoc or as needed basis. Lastly, as we talk about the tasks that you see over here on the left side of Shadow Protect Backup Restore, Explore Backup and Dismount Image, this explore backup and dismount backup image is the way within the console that you actually restore files and folders. But as I mentioned as we got started, you're not required to do that from within our proprietary console. So this kind of allows me to segue outside of the console straight over into Windows Explorer, which we obviously are all familiar with. My Windows Explorer uh, screen is pointed to a NAS device that I have here on premise. That NAS device has an SMB share that we have created, and underneath that SMB share is a unique folder for every system in my network that I'm backing up. And you can see on the right-hand side, I've got a number of those folders here um, within that SMB share on my NAS. So what I'm going to do is drill down into one of those folders and just scroll down to a backup that you see that was created of my C volume back on June 6th of 2013. And what I'm going to do is just right click on that proprietary backup file. And folks, what I want to point out is the three new right click menu options you have at the top of this right click selection. You've got a mount, as you see in bold, a quick mount, and a virtual boot. These are what we call our mount tools or mount services, and they are part of the Shadow Protect install and completely free of charge. The great part about these tools is you can put them on any computer within the customer environment or network environment without having Shadow Protect installed, the console installed, and these tools will allow you to restore files and folders and even resurrect an entire server in just minutes from our, our proprietary backup files, as long as you have access to those backup files where they're stored on the network. So I'm going to show you the quick mount first, and what I want to point out here is the quick mount is going to take this backup again from the 6th of June, and over here on my computer, we're going to find the next available local drive letter and we are going to map that drive letter, and we're going to spawn a new window of Windows Explorer, and just that easily I am browsing a backup that was created back in June of 2013. So now if I want to, I can just drill down anywhere within that particular um, volume, and of course scroll, say, to my documents where I've got a number of things maybe that I want to restore. A couple of Word documents, maybe an Excel, uh, a, a PDF file rather, Obviously, that very mission critical data, right? Picture your kids having fun. Everybody needs to restore that. <laughs> so either way, what I'm going to do here, folks, I'm just going to grab a couple of these files, okay? And uh, I'm going to right click. I'm going to copy them. And just that easily, I can bounce back to my desktop or any location on the network or even within an email and paste them. In this case, I'll create a folder, right click, and paste. And just that easily, I've restored files out of a backup that was created last June. Okay? Pretty quick and easy. The thing about that is that this person who did this doesn't necessarily have access to the actual Shadow Protect console to be able to get in there and do it. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah, so, so that would be, be a, a nice, nice uh, if you've got, got uh, as, as an IT department, if you've got a different set of IT administrators, maybe you've got somebody that is a backup administrator, yet they have no other access to any other por portion of the IT management within that organization, they can have these tools and they can quickly go through these restores without impacting the Shadow Protect console, the, the production-based backups in any way. Okay? Great point, Shanna. Thank you for pointing that out. When we're done with that mount, we just like to encourage you to right-click on it and we just do a quick dismount and it just simply dismounts that mount point, okay, or restore point. Now if I go back and let's pick a different file, let's just 
go to a later day, say the 10th of June, and now I right click and actually do the bold mount or this full mount as we call it. The primary difference here is that that quick mount is what we call a read only mount and the bold mount is a read write mount. So we encourage uh, customers and partners to use the bold mount when doing a couple of key components in regards to restore. It also, as you can see, acts a little different in that it's going to bring up a wizard and it's going to provide us some pretty intuitive information and great metadata about the backup and in turn the system that we've backed up. So you can see here I'm backing up my C drive of this system. I'm using a, a standard compression, um, which you can see is recommended in parentheses. And by the way, folks, our standard compression is about 30 to 40 percent on average. Okay? Within the Shadow Protect console and the backup job, you can drop down that compression option and select a high compression, and it'll get you some additional um, compression percentage. But as we all probably are aware, compression is only as good as the data is actually going to allow us to compress it. So some data and backups will just compress better than others by nature of what's, what that data is. Okay? We also get to show the encryption type. Now for this specific backup, I didn't run any encryption, but I'm going to show you a backup that's encrypted here in just a little bit. I uh, want to point out that we offer three different encryption types at the time of backup, um, RC4128, 128 AES, and AES256, of course, military grade encryption. We also get to see some, the um, specific uh, engine version that we used or core version of our product to create the backup. We show you the machine's name, the MAC address, the IP address, the service pack levels, and we also show you the partition length, which can be very important if you're using our product excuse me, to bare metal recover to dissimilar hardware or even to the same hardware in the event of a component failure. As we hit next here, we're going to start to see now some similar behavior um, in that uh, we're, we're getting ready to mount this restore point to a drive letter, but before we do that, we just confirm all of the dependencies within the chain from the point in time I want to restore all the way back to that first full backup that we created. Again, we get to see some additional metadata of the system here, uh, much like we saw on the previous screen. And as we hit next, this is really the differentiator with this mount we get to specify the drive letter that we want this to mount to, or we could actually mount it to an existing NTFS folder. The reason that, that we might want to run a read-write mount again, folks, and here's the big differentiator, you check this box that says Allow Writes. And this is going to allow me to segue into two things, um, the read-write as a whole, and then how we use that read-write and dismount. Read-write as a whole can be a great way to retain Active Directory permissions. So as you want to restore files and folders back into an existing network infrastructure where you've got Active Directory security permissions, you would want to use the read-write mount so we can inherit those permissions as we drop the files back into play. Now, let's say, for example, you're using this mount and you open a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. And as you open that document upon restore, you notice corruption and you're not exactly sure why, so you open another file, restore another file from within that backup, it also appears to have corruption. What you can do is mount this to a drive letter or an NTFS folder and actually run a third-party utility against it, like an antivirus scanner or a check disk. And we will actually allow you to clean the particular problem and preserve this file by saving it as a new incremental file so that you can restore from it in the future after you've cleaned the particular damage to that backup. Now this can obviously be advantageous because you can in fact clean a problemed backup um, on the fly with a third party utility. Now where we, um, what we like to point out in regards to the rights being saved to a new file, unlike our competition, where there are many backup providers out there that actually merge your full backups and your incremental backups when they're doing either consolidation or retaining of this data. We do not do that and we don't believe in doing that because we never want to jeopardize the integrity of the original files that we wrote to disk. So that's why we will save this as a new incremental file, thus not touching or jeopardizing in any way, shape, or form the original chain um, or backup data that we created. Okay? So it's a really uh, unique um, attribute to our product. 
because again, many of our competitors will say, well, we create synthetic backups and we take the consolidated backups and merge them with the full backups. In turn, shrinking your backup in size and allowing for that backup to efficiently be able to be restored from. Well, we're still going to have the same level of efficiency, but we are not going to modify or change that, that production chain in any way. So you can see here the results of that, folks, was exactly the same what we just saw. We did mount to that E drive. It spun up Windows Explorer, and here we are within that copy and paste um, uh, capability. So when we're done, we're just going to right click, and again, instead of the quick dismount like we did before, we're going to do the full dismount. We're going to kick off our wizard. It's going to confirm the volume or mount point that we're going to dismount, and here's where we can make those um, changes. Okay, so we just check the box that says, says cha save changes to a new incremental file, and, I, and it will write out a new incremental as part of uh, this process. Also want to point out that we do allow for some volume shrinkage. Um, when you, you might use that in a time when you're restoring maybe to us, again, a smaller volume than the original server that was backed up. Uh, not a very common practice when it comes to servers and mission critical machines, but can be, can be commonly used in backing up desktops, especially as we move away from uh, traditional hard disks in laptops and move to SSD or solid state drives. In a lot of cases, those drives are smaller in actual footprint just due to cost and availability. Um, I do want to point out to you that, that when you're using the tool set to shrink the volume, you actually are using a combination of our tools and Microsoft's tools. So we are not creating this shrinkage natively within our platform. We do use a portion of Microsoft's tool set to do that. Now, I didn't make any changes to this backup, so I'm going to uncheck that save changes. I'm going to hit next and finish. And just that quickly, folks, again, we've dismounted that, that backup or restore point uh, that was created back in June. Okay. Um, I do want to take just a second and ask if there's any other questions in regards to file and folder level recovery before I move on to uh, another portion of our presentation. If, yes. you, if you do back up um, an entire server in one backup job, and it's got five drives, let's say, when you go to mount, um, you can still pick the mounting on for each individual drive, right? Correct. Yeah, great question. It, let me bounce back yeah, over great to question. Uh, let me bounce back over to um, my backups folder again on this NAS device. So you can see here this particular backup chain, okay, everything that's contained within this volume or this folder has a D volume and a C volume. So I would be able to independently mount those volumes um, without the operating system correlating operating system being mounted as well. Now, Does that answer your question? Yeah, but there is a, there is a way to, um, I'm, I'm asking this really, is there a way to just take the entire backup job, restore the whole thing, and I assume in that situation it's going to pull all five? Yes, yeah, right? great question. So um, what we have been talking about at the moment is restoring files and folders and using the console to restore volumes. Now, if we're sitting on a server, that we want to restore the C volume of, we obviously can't do that while inside of the Windows operating system. So that's a great question, and it does allow me to um, segue into our recovery environment. So when you want to restore an entire server and every volume on that backup, um, typically you're going to do that by booting into our recovery environment, which is a free recovery environment. Um, again, another differentiator between us and our competitors, many of our competitors want you to create a unique recovery disk for every machine that you're backing up. With us, we actually allow a generic recovery environment that's going to work across a desktop, a server, a virtual server, a small business server. Our recovery environment is the same across all platforms. And so within that recovery environment, it is a bootable recovery environment that's built off of the Windows pre-boot or PE environment. Therefore, it includes the Microsoft uh, PE or driver library as part of that recovery environment. And we have updated that recovery library to include uh, the recent release of Windows Server 2012 R2 and Windows 8 um, and 8.1. So the drivers that are included in our recovery environment are the Microsoft driver libraries that come with those operating systems that in, include an excess of 65, 75,000 drivers. Okay? Within the, driver, the recovery environment, StorageCraft has also accumulated a driver library over the years 
of kind of some random or miscellaneous drivers um, that we found for network cards, chip, motherboard chipsets, etc. But probably the most important thing about our recovery environment in that driver library, you are not stuck with the drivers that we provide you. You are able to inject whatever driver for whatever piece of hardware you want along the way, which is why we see such a higher success with our recovery to dissimilar hardware and our conversion from virtual servers to physical servers, physical servers to virtual servers, and again, physical server to physical server to dissimilar hardware, dissimilar manufacturer, and even dissimilar chipset. Because again, if that driver is not included in our driver library, at any point in that restore, you can point our recovery environment to a specific INF or driver to inject as you're performing the recovery. Okay? So enrolling an entire, just as a, as a synopsis, the question was if you wanted to restore an entire machine, where do you do that from? And you do that from our recovery environment um, that we do give you completely free of charge as long as you have an active and valid Shadow Protect license. Okay? That, uh, it's also, uh, last thing I want to say about that recovery environment is we do allow you to run that recovery environment from a CD, from an ISO, or from a USB stick. So you can create a bootable media form in whatever you'd like or whatever is going to best suit the environment that you're working within in regards to recovery. That answer your question? Sorry, I Thank you. wasn't using the correct No, no, no. That's all. that's why we're here is to help help educate and help help you guys through this stuff. Um, okay. So now I want to show you really one of my favorite parts of recovery, folks, which is again part of this mount tool set that I talked about, and what we call this is virtual boot. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the backup that actually ran when we kicked off today's meeting at uh, 10 after 12. So just 30 minutes ago, this backup ran. The backup is pretty small in size. It only, it only picked up about 17 megabytes worth of changes, 17 and a half there. Okay? So from this file, I'm going to right click on it, and what I'm going to do is select the virtual boot option. Okay? Uh, let me do one thing real quick to make sure that is prepped and ready to go. And it is, okay, it is, yep, so what we'll do is we'll right click and we'll, we're going to select virtual boot. So what we use here for this tool set, folks, is we use a free type 2 hypervisor out on, in, in the world called Oracle's Virtual Box, which many of you have probably heard of. Um, prior to Oracle buying Sun, this was a Sun-built product, and our... Um, our development team got together with, at the time, Sun's development team, and basically took our proprietary backup files and told VirtualBox to treat it just like a virtual disk and just turn it on. So that's in turn what we do here. I want to point out a couple of, of things. Again, this is part of the mount tools that are free of charge and can be installed on any computer. This one tool set is the one that has a prerequisite, though. And I'm going to point these out, but you can see them listed out here in the attention portion of the splash screen. First and foremost, we only support specific integrated versions of Oracle VirtualBox. And as you're getting ready to do this for the first time on a computer, we're going to provide you a URL or a link out to that latest integrated version. So this isn't something that you and your IT team have to go and prep for. Oh, let us go get the latest version of this tool installed on this machine really quick. Um, not required. We're going to navigate you to that uh, latest download and installation. This, because I remember in my previous with my previous employer doing this and having to search for an older version. Yes. Version of virtual, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And if. You know, just like many, many tools and softwares that get installed, every now and again they're going to come up and tell you there's a newer version to the product available. We just tell you to say no. Just say no. Um, but if you accidentally did, right, and we all do it. I, I did it myself. Um, you know, I thought I was updated Adobe, and I just said yes, and there it was. Whoops, I upgraded VirtualBox. You can just simply uninstall it as you uninstall any other application from that Windows environment. And again, right click, select virtual boot, and we're going to bring the link back up to that latest integrated version. Okay? Um, the machine that you are performing the virtual boot process from has a couple of prerequisites. Number one, it needs to be a physical machine. Um, 
Number two, the machine cannot have a hypervisor role enabled on it. So it cannot be, say, a Windows server with the Hyper-V role enabled. It must be a physical box without any kind of hypervisor component enabled on it. However, the machine has to support virtualization. So to virtual boot a 64-bit operating system from a backup, you do have to have the VT or AMD V chipset enabled in the BIOS. In other words, the virtualization extensions. Okay? To boot a 32-bit operating system, those virtualization extensions are not required. Okay? Um, the other thing the, in the last component, and um, this is a bit of a, a, of a funny one, it says here that we have to have at least a gig of RAM available to boot um, 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 from a virtual, uh, into a virtual machine from our backup. That is really a relative statement based upon the original size of the server that you are trying to virtual boot. So in short, um, our rule of thumb is find a machine with half of the amount of RAM that the original machine had that you can allocate. So in other words, if you have, you're taking a backup of a file server, which is what we're doing here, my file server had four gigs of RAM initially, I want to find a machine with at least two gigs of free RAM available to allocate to that backup for us to spin up the machine virtually. Okay? So the first thing that comes up here as I hit next on the virtual boot wizard is it wants an encryption password. This is important because this um, refers back to our encryption processes and methods. If you do not have, if you do not remember the encryption password applied to that backup, the backup is rendered useless. Okay? So when you mount that backup, when you full mount the backup, when you virtual boot the backup, any single solitary thing you want to do with that backup will require the encryption password. We do not have the ability to crack that password. We can't get access to that data at StorageCraft or within our tech support team. So it's very important that those passwords get documented and remain documented as um, passwords change within the network environment or if you change the encryption password, you're going to want to make sure that you make note of that because without it, we cannot um, recover from that backup. It's a separate password? It does. It, the backup job itself is what contains that encryption password. And you do set that up at the time of backup. Thank you for asking that. Um, applying encryption to a backup post backup can only be done in an image conversion. And then that backup chain cannot be appended to. So you have to enable encryption at the time of backup creation if you want it to remain in place as you continue to take backups. Okay. Okay. So here in this environment, what we're showing you is, is here's the backup that we took it at uh, 10 after 12. It's confirming the name of the server that, or machine that we backed up, confirms where that file is stored and which particular file it is, confirms what volume is being booted, and if that volume is bootable. As we hit next, this is where we actually get to tell the VirtualBox toolset what to do upon, uh, upon completion. So we're going to automatically create the new virtual machine. We're going to automatically start it. And here's where we actually get to specify some unique parameters. What's the name of the computer you're going to virtual boot? Well, folks, this is um, what, what we're talking about here is resurrecting a machine in just minutes. Now, whether you're doing that in disaster recovery mode or you're doing it as a test, you can choose which method. And we like to talk about this being used as a testing methodology. Because if you can take any server of any size and back it up, and I'm sorry, recover it and turn it on as a VM in 10 to 15 minutes, why would you not do that as a test? Resurrect an entire server. As we all know in file and folder backups and in other backup strategies, to test recovery of an entire machine is very painful, very time consuming, and assumes you've got extra hardware, you've got the resources to do that, etc. So what we will allow you to do is, of course, boot this machine up on the fly in just minutes. So if you're doing it as a test and the original server is actually still online, what you may want to do is just simply create a unique name. So you notice I just put test at the end of that server name. Now, folks, I want to clarify something here. This is not renaming the how or the SID of that Windows machine. Okay? So over time, even if that one of the next parameters is the network adapter, you can see in the bottom of the screen, what am I going to do with the network adapter for this virtual machine? 
if I'm natting the network adapter to my local network adapter on my laptop, then I'm not going to be obtaining an IP address conflict. Okay? But if I were to run this machine, even in an added configuration, on an environment where that original server is still online and I ran it for a day or two days, at some point you're going to make WINS and DNS pretty unhappy. So what we say is either NAT it, turn it on, make sure everything's working, and turn it off within a handful of minutes, or you can always isolate this machine without any network adapter at all so that you're at least resurrecting the entire machine but you're not communicating to the rest of the network. Okay? And that has its advantages and disadvantages much like anything. Um, one of the disadvantages I like to point out and it may seem obvious is the ability to continue to communicate to other network resources which obviously in the event of a disaster you're probably going to want to confirm that this machine can not only be resurrected but that can also continue to communicate with other network resources or components. Okay? So in this particular um, test, I actually do not have my file server up and running. So I am going to very comfortably be able to boot this machine up in its entirety and NAT it to my network adapter. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and hit next and we're going to hit finish. And uh, just this quickly, we are going to be starting the injection of drivers and the boot up of this machine. And something I want to point out to you on the screen right now is that we are starting our HIR configuration. And this is HIR is a trademarked acronym within StorageCraft in our product and it stands for Hardware Independent Restore. What the virtual boot does with the HIR process is it actually looks at the header of the backup, finds the operating system, finds the hardware configuration from that backup header and begins automatically injecting drivers from that driver library to get this box to resurrect as quickly as possible. Okay? So one of the things I like to, to point out, I think just because it's an easy talking point here, um, while we're finishing out the, the um, injection and boot up of this machine, is let's just take a laptop as an example, which in many cases these days, laptops are coming with HDMI uh, full 1080p video drivers okay, and video adapters. Well, obviously we don't necessarily need a 1080p video driver or, or um, adapter just to resurrect a machine. Okay, so we're going to inject uh, SVGA, XVGA, VGA, plug and play, um, simple driver to allow that machine to boot up as quickly as possible. But of course, just like anything, if you have a specific driver that needs to be installed for that machine, we're going to allow you to do that after the machine has been booted up or turned on as a virtual machine. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Again, what we're doing as we go through that, that injection is pulling from the driver library, uh, from that hardware, uh, or, or the header of the backup rather, and injecting those drivers. So you can see here it comes up and does kind of detect, well, wait a minute, Windows is not um, able to start up normally. So we can just go ahead and, and tell it to do that uh, with, a man, with manual intervention or, of course, just wait for that magic 30 seconds to tick down and, and it'll automatically start up in normal mode. So, the thing I want to point out to you here is that, again, we're booting this machine up from our proprietary backup, and we are booting it up in a NATed configuration. So if we wanted to actually boot this up and get it back on the network for users to reconnect, then after the machine has been connected um, and booted up, we're actually going to change the NATed configuration to a bridged configuration and bridge it directly onto the network where again, that WINS and DNS name is going to begin propagating, the IP address of the machine is going to begin propagating, and you will then allow those users to immediately get back on that system as if it never left the network environment to begin with. So as you can see, folks, the machine is back up and running. I'm going to go ahead and log into it. Um, and while I'm logging in, I want to also point out to you or, or comment on a, a usage scenario that we actually have a white paper and a case study uh, written up about in regards to um, uh, this, this tool set being used. We had a ski resort and lodge back at, um, in Utah where our corporate office is located and they lost their business practice server, the server that generated all of their lift tickets, all of their lodging um, for their customers on Christmas Eve night. It literally caught on fire. 
um, that server obviously was not going to be usable again. So they called their hardware vendor and said, listen, we've got to order a new, a new piece of hardware ASAP and get it here. Um, and the guy said, no problem, I'll order it up. It'll be there in about four days. And the guy goes, well, wait a minute, <laughs> four days? Um, if I can't generate lift tickets and lodging sales and, in other words, um, you know, actually work with my customer base over those next four days, my business may never recover from that kind of an outage. So what they did was call us. They happened to have Shadow Protect backups. Um, long story short, we found a machine that met those prerequisites that I talked about on the front end of this process. We virtual booted that business practice server. They ran on it for five days. When, we actually, when that new server arrived, they prepped it, stuck it in their rack. The beauty of our product is you can be running live on this virtual machine, and you can actually start a restore simultaneously. So what we what you actually do is we pre-stage a restore, and we start that restoration and tell it to stop at a certain point in time. So at, in this example, we started restoring all the way up until Thursday night's backup. Friday day when we came in, all we had to do was then just simply apply Friday's restore points to that machine and resurrect it at that point with the most recent changes created inside of this virtual booted instance. So in other words, folks, they used this virtual boot as a production machine for five working days while we then failed the backups back over to dissimilar hardware. End to end, we were able to keep the downtime to 60 minutes with that particular customer, okay? And if you think about the amount of downtime that, it, that you're normally contending with with a crash server between procurement, operating system load, patch and service packs, installing of the backup software, and then restoring the data on top of it, hoping that it all comes back to life, many of us have been through that, and it's not always a successful and fun process. So what we're saying is that we're going to give you the ability to successfully recover this machine with an interim ability to run back in production as a VM, all the while mitigating and minimizing that downtime to you, which obviously is very, co is very costly. Okay? Um, some of our competitors, again, just to talk about some differentiators here, um, a lot of our competitors will provide you, um, we, we are the only ones that can do this, by the way. This virtual boot is unique to our product. Um, if you folks see it out there in any way, shape, or form, it's probably one of our OEM partners that's doing it. So the way our competitors have combated this process is, and this tool set, is they give you a screenshot or a JPEG or BMP of a Control-Alt-Delete inside of your job log after the backup completes. Well, as many of us know that have managed Windows servers over time, when do those Windows servers complain after recovery? It's when you actually log into Windows because Windows goes to load a driver that it's not happy with, and boom, you get a blue screen, and that server is not truly recovered. So what we say is we're not just going to give you a screenshot, log into it. So whether you're testing or whether you're using this as disaster recovery in a pinch, folks, the machine is up. As you can see, I'm logged into it. I've started my storage craft, uh, my Shadow Protect software, and I want to point out to you that if I want to, I can just simply start running backups again inside of this virtual booted instance. But let me point something out to you. We disable the backup job, and we do this on purpose, because if you're just doing it as a test and you resurrect that machine, we don't want it to take a backup if you're just doing a test. Okay? But if you are using it as disaster recovery, um, in a pinch mode, as we call it, you can just simply unpause or enable the backup job, and you'll notice this backup is going to run its next iteration at 5.18 this afternoon. Okay? So um, it is not. Backup? It's not. That's been there for a couple of versions now. Hmm. So we, we do that because, again, if you're, if you're testing and you've missed a backup yeah. window, it'll kick off a backup. So we do disable it by nature. Um, again, or, or by default, yeah, to, or ensure by that's default to ensure that that's not happening. Because, okay. um, I mean, that makes sense what you said. Yeah, it's yeah. great to have that, but when I've done this in the past, a year and a half, two years ago, I remember mm -hmm. backups continuing, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. I never went in and... Well, the other thing, that if, if you... you um, um, one of the reasons I bring up the Shadow Protect console right, right off the bat as we log into this machine is for that exact reason. Um, I would um, definitely recommend going into the Shadow Protect console. Make sure that you're able to connect to the machine just like you could when it was physical, and make sure that that job is, is paused. 
um, if, or disabled. If it's not, um, go ahead and, and pause it. If you're just doing a test, turn the machine off and, and no harm, no foul. No backups will be taken. Okay? Pretty neat stuff, right? So when we're done with that, folks, literally, we just turn it off. Um, I can shut this machine down. Um, or I can, of course, from within the, the hypervisor, you know, this is, this is another hypervisor, I can just simply power the machine off, okay? And it'll go ahead and turn that off, all right? Instances of the tool set software when you purchase? Shadow you Protect? do. So that, that virtual tool, tool set comes, comes free of charge with Shadow, Shadow Protect by default. It's, it's not required. required to install. So if you were to do a custom install, you have the ability to check that tool set as, as part of the installation. Imagining having a Shadow Protect console server where I'm doing my centralized administration. All these servers are being backed up. Yep, yep. Um, but if I had to do a virtual boot of one of those backup servers, I don't want it to happen on my Shadow Protect console box, so I would need that yeah, software yeah. somewhere. You, you, you may, may not. not. Now, there, 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 that's, that's actually a great, a great kind of um, statement and, and, um, and not exactly a question, but let me turn it into a question um, and say that um, many of our installations have occurred at what we call a BDR level, where a customer or a partner is dropping in a, a specific server. On that server, it runs the Shadow Protect console. It has all the storage where the backups are going to be stored, and it runs our image manager tool set. But that box itself is not being backed up. It's a backup server, right, if you will. So in, in many cases, the customer will build a BDR device that has the resources available to actually perform the virtual boot on it as well. Um, so that you could use from that same single device that is not only your Shadow Protect console, but your storage repository, it's also the machine that would resurrect those backups as a VM in just minutes. So you, so could, you could do it, do it, that, it way. that way. But, but larger, larger environments, environments typically are going to install that tool set in multiple places so that, again, you're not required or pulled in to get from that BPR or backup server device because it can be done on any computer. So it does allow for some pretty neat flexibility there that that, that if, if you don't have, have a BDR or a dedicated backup, backup server, server, it doesn't mean you can't, you can't utilize, utilize this tool set for recovery method. That. You, you definitely can. can. Definitely can. Now, now, I know we are, are running, uh, running uh, up, up against our, our slotted time, time but, but I actually do have, have uh, um, some additional time that I can go over um, the pre-scheduled time if you guys are all okay with that. I'll just keep going for a little bit. Um, because what I really want to make sure we get a chance to cover is our image manager tool set. And the reason being is because, again, image manager is where we're going to be generating and running a number of our advanced components. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to keep going, dive right into image manager. As I mentioned to you guys um, on the front end of the call um, or the presentation here, image manager is our image handler. So what it does is it takes those shadow protect backups that are sitting out on that storage device, whether that's a, a locally attached hard drive, a shared storage solution like a NAS or a SAN, and it's actually going to run through consolidation, verification, and retention of that backup chain. One of the reasons that we talk about this and talk about it being so critical is because for um, disaster recovery and business continuity, what's one of the first things that any, um, any conversation will lead to when we talk about that? Getting data off-site. Right? Data is, is always, uh, people are always scared that with data being held within their network environment, if there is ever a site destroying catastrophe, you have done yourself no good by just leaving that data and those backups there on premise. So let's get away and give you a way to get that data off premise to a secondary or tertiary location. So Image Manager is going to allow us folks to take the data that's stored in these folders where we're writing the backups and replicate that data off-site, okay? First and foremost, within Image Manager, what you'll notice across the top is Image Manager is pointing to that NAS location and that SMB share that I brought to your attention earlier. So if I minimize Windows, Manage, uh, Windows Explorer here, you'll notice my NAS and a backups folder, and then underneath that backups folder, the unique folder for every machine that we're backing up. So that path follows suit here in Image Manager within the Managed Folder. So in order to create that Managed Folder, I just click on Start Managing a Folder. I put in the folder path. 
I put in the folder description, and then if that folder were to require any kind of additional authentication, whether it's a NAS or a SAN, you can obviously propagate that, um, that authentication credentials here. Once the managed folder has been established and you see it across the top, you'll notice we provide ongoing statistics of that folder. What the folder size is, how much free space is available on the disk, how many files are located within those folders, okay? Also, over here underneath the managed folder tasks is where we actually set up those core components, that verification, consolidation, and retention. So let's talk about that in a little bit of detail. First and foremost, I want to talk about verification. We're an imaging technology, folks, so unlike file and folder backups, we're not looking at the source server or computer that we backed up, looking at the destination of the backup repository and ensuring that all files exist. We just look at the image file that we created and we write a forensics grade MD5 hash value or integrity checker that gets uniquely assigned to every file that we write to disk. So as Shadow Protect takes a backup and writes it out to disk, we immediately verify that file and its structure. Structure of the file, attributes of the file, and ensure that that structure remains intact by applying an MD5 integrity checker or checksum to it, okay? So what we want to do is Shadow Protect is going to immediately verify the file as it writes it. Well, when that file gets dropped into the storage device, Image Manager is also going to immediately verify the file as you see listed here. As the file sits out on disk and gains historic value, whether you're retaining that data for a month, six months, a year, six years, or ten years, which is what our retention schedule will allow for, all the way up to ten years worth of data retention in a backup, we want you to also periodically re-verify those files as they sit out on disk. So what we're doing here is telling Image Manager to every two days go out into that storage repository and individually verify every file that exists. Okay? So that's a little bit about our verification process and important, obviously, if you're retaining data five, six, seven years down the road for any kind of regulatory requirements, whether it's HIPAA, Sarbanes-Ox, or anything like that, you're going to want to ensure that this data, data is verified, verified on an ongoing basis, basis and has, and the, has integrity the integrity that you expect, expect to have to, have to be able to recover from it. Okay? Consolidation settings, important, um, uh, the other important, one of the other important components here. All the while, um, with today's presentation, folks, I've been talking about what we call a continuous incremental backup. And that is our best practice for disaster recovery and business continuity. The reason it is is because the continuous incremental backup actually takes one full backup of that system or the volumes within. We never take a full backup again. We only take incrementals based on the sectors of the local volumes that change. So it allows us to keep those backups small in size, but obviously with backups every 15 minutes for 24 hours a day, you could be generating upwards of 97 backup files per day. That's a lot of files to, to restore from, especially if you're going to retain those files for 10 years. So what we do is we consolidate the chain based on a daily consolidation, a weekly consolidation, and a monthly consolidation. And again, something I want to point out to you, as I pointed out when we talked about saving that incremental that we modified to a new one, our automation of consolidation also creates new files. We do not take the incrementals and merge them with your full production backup files, creating synthetic full backups like our competitors do. We create new consolidated files. Again, thus us not jeopardizing or touching the original files that we wrote to disk and preserving the integrity that we, um, we wrote down with those original files. So consolidation occurs daily, weekly, and monthly. What you're seeing on the screen is only the ability for us to enable and control the weekly consolidation and the monthly consolidation. Reason being is because the daily consolidation happens automatically whether we want it to or not, and we do not um, allow you to turn that on or off, okay? So what we're going to control here, and there is really no um, set of best practices for this, folks. The weekly consolidation um, is going to be about what makes most sense for your environment or the customer environment. 
if, if the customer is a 24-7 shop and maybe their maintenance window is a very specific window, a Sunday or Saturday, whatever, maybe it's a Wednesday night, whatever that day might be, then you would likely want to put that weekly consolidation and even the monthly consolidation into that specific window of downtime that the customer is allotted. Okay? I have mine set, I, I like to keep it kind of simple um, and, and not very difficult for me to think about when I'm looking at all of the backup files that I'm generating. So I have my weekly consolidation running on a weekend. Just seems to make sense to me. Sir, question in the back? Does it provide you with a consolidation report? Um, it confirms that the consolidation occurred within the job log, but you don't um, necessarily get a report from it. From it. You can be notified that the consolidation did occur and succeeded via an email notification. Is that? You can, you can, but we also, I'll show you where the image manager notification is here in just a minute, and you can definitely select um, the activity status that will notify you through just a standard email that the collapse or the consolidation has occurred and occurred successfully. Okay? The monthly monthly consolidation, again, very similar, no real set of best practices here. I have mine set to a specific day, being the 31st. Um, if the month does not contain 31 days, it will do it on the last day of that month. So if it's February or June, it'll run on 28, 29, or the 30th, okay? Another question? So if you wanted to do a recovery, and you were doing this consolidation of continuous incrementals, um, when you go to choose to do the recovery, it's automatic, or even just amount of sure, sure. volume? Sure, sure it's automatically going to pick the consolidation files, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. To build that volume. Um, and so it's possible then that you might be missing a particular file that maybe was added and deleted the next day and maybe the week consolidation didn't have that. And is yes. that why you keep the individual days also so that you could say, Forget doing it the normal way. I'm going to go straight to this incremental file. And yeah, what, it, what it, it is maybe not as much um, a missing file, but as much as it is um, the granularity of those backups. So, in other words, um, the the question was, do we go straight to the consolidated files to recover, or if those consolidated files didn't contain the data you were looking for, can you go to one of the other incrementals to recover it? It's a great question, and every one of the files that we write, whether it is what we call an intra-daily backup or it is a consolidated backup, they are all incremental files, and every one of them could be recovered from. So it's the granularity that you might be looking for in which file you would pick to start your recovery from. So let's, let me talk that out a little bit more for a second. We do the backups that we take all throughout the day, whether this is a uh, backup every 15 minutes, a backup every hour, whatever the duration of the backups are, we call those backups intra-daily backups. If those backups are running, let's just say we're running those intra-daily backups every hour, okay? And a, uh, a user creates a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we back it up at 9, we back it up at 10, but at 10.30, they accidentally deleted that Word document, but didn't realize it for several weeks down the road. We are an image, so at 9 o'clock, we took a picture or an image of the server. It, the file was there. At 10 o'clock, we took another image or picture of the server. The file was still there. At 10.30, it was deleted. So at 11 o'clock, when we took the next image, it wasn't there. 12 o'clock, it wasn't there, and so on, all the way through the end of the day. Once we do a consolidated daily, we are cumulative change to the volume. So all we do is look to the last backup that we took and the change on the volume between that last backup and when we write our consolidation, and that's what the consolidated daily really looks like. So in turn, that Word document or Excel spreadsheet can only be recovered from the 10 o'clock or the 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock intra-daily backup, okay? But you have the ability to retain intra-daily backups for a certain number of days, consolidated daily backups for a certain number of days, and so on. And it's a great segue out of consolidation right into retention. So as you look on the screen now, this is um, exactly what I was just talking about. So we're going to give you the ability to retain these backups all for a, a certain period of time, all the way up to 10 years worth of data retention. So as you can see at the very top here, we are automatically cleaning up the files within the backup chain. So 
This process runs automatically with Image Manager just like consolidation on, an, on a nightly basis and verification of the data. But right here at the top, we're telling Image Manager how long in number of days we are going to keep the intra-daily backups. Again, those backups that run all throughout the day. We give you the ability to retain them for up to one year. Okay? In my retention policy, this is a very aggressive policy that I have set. And I have it set this way for these exact demos and, and conversations. I'm keeping those intra-daily backups for 15 days. So in short, with the example I just gave, those Word documents or Excel spreadsheets that were created, I would be able to recover those from that 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock backup for 15 days. On the 16th day, I start overwriting the oldest intra-daily backups. I would not be able to recover those files anymore after the 16th day. Okay? So it can be very important to really think out your retention policies because um, you want to obviously be able to retain as much data as possible without any kind of compromise to that data over time, but of course have enough disk space to store that data for the period of time that you need it. Okay? So just like we're taking those intradailies and keeping them for 15 days at the end of the day when we do our consolidated dailies, I'm telling Image Manager to retain those for 31 days. So again, those Excel spreadsheets or Word documents, as long as they were on disk all day and made it to the consolidated daily, I would not only have 15 days to recover it from the intradailies, I'd have another 31 days to recover them from the consolidated dailies. If the files were kept on disk for an entire week, I'd also be able to restore them from the consolidated weeklies, which in my policy here, I'm keeping for 45 days. On the 46th day, I'm going to start deleting the oldest consolidated weekly file. And lastly, we create a consolidated monthly, and that is the furthest consolidation point that we offer. So you'll notice the clean up of those consolidated monthly files is an option. It's a checkbox. Because in a lot of cases, people will not want to clean up the consolidated monthlies. They will want them to build and build and build and build over time, allowing the IT folks to manually manage that retention and not be forced into a policy that automatically overwrites. Let's, let's face it, in a lot of cases, we're looking for automation as IT people and engineers. We don't have enough time in the day to do all the things we have to do. So things that we can automate that really truly allow us to kind of set it and forget it is a great, it's a great tool for us, but sometimes we want to ensure we have that interaction within the tool set. We want to go in and make sure as IT managers that, that we can get the data we can get and we have control over that in a, in a manual capacity. So in this environment, I am telling it to clean up those consolidated monthlies every three months. So just a simple recap. I cannot restore anything from the backup chain of this file server backup that exceeds 90 days in age. And it's a very aggressive policy, but again, I do that for these types of presentations so I can explain it and we can, we can kind of open it up to conversation and talk about it. Does that consolidation, retention, verification that we just covered, does that make sense everybody, to everybody? Are there, are there, are there any other any questions, questions that, that while we're here, here I, can, I, can, I can make I can sure we're addressed? addressed? It's great the way it balances that. It's like you said, you don't want your disks to run to space out of room, room because of yeah. all these incrementals. Yeah. 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 Um, but on the other hand, you need the consolidation well, because you want to recover quicker. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and that's, that's yeah. another great that's another point. Obviously, point. Obviously, obviously, consolidation, consolidation retention, retention is doing, is doing what, what, folks? It's taking, it's taking that, that chain, chain it's and its number, number of file. files and shrinking the number of files down in addition to the size of those files. And ultimately, the smaller the chain is in both length and overall size, the more efficient the recovery process will be across the board. Okay, But we don't want you to jeopardize retention just because you want an efficient backup. So look right here, we give you again the ability to retain all the way up to 120 months. So what you really think about is how long does that data stay on disk? As long as the data stays on disk for one month, you can really focus in on that long-term retention right down here. It's when the files don't stay on disk for a month because of either user error, file corruption, or whatever the case, that you really tend to restore from these more granular levels. Okay? Um, 
The other thing that's important to know is as we run consolidation and retention and we're deleting that historical data, what are we doing? We're giving you back disk space reclamation on that storage device. Right? So as we retain and delete that historical data that we don't need anymore, we're giving you back disk space on the storage appliance. Okay? Any questions about that? So All right. don't check that box. Oh yeah, it's not ten bottom, years and forever. Bottom, 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 bottom. Oh, oh, if you don't, don't check, check this, this box. box. Yes, yes, that's, that's correct. correct. Those consolidated <laughs> monthlies will build and build and build until somebody goes in and manually intervenes and either stops that process, creates a new chain. Um, it is actually a great thing for us because it allows again for people to get back into that environment, manage the backups the way they want to and really get, get, take control of it again as opposed to automating some of these processes. But we're flexible either way and we want you to have the flexibility accordingly. Now this last box over here, move consolidated images into a subdirectory instead of deleting them. That's one box that we don't and recommend checking, checking because, because it will, it will never, never give you space, space on that storage, storage device. device. Because right now we can't tell Image Manager where that directory resides. It is a default and it's part of the same folder structure that we are managing up here on the NAS or the storage environment. So in turn, we just move them to a folder, don't delete them, and therefore you're not getting that, that key disk space reclamation back on your storage device. It would be great if you don't have space issues because your restores would be quicker because you yes. got the validation yes. to yep. get yep. if it doesn't have that one file that you know existed at this particular day. You, you can go there, there and look at it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. And so, and so that, 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 that is a, it's a, another great point is if you have endless amounts of disk space, that's a box that you might want to check that way giving you the ability to have um, complete granular capability for restore across the board. Let's move over to, to the last, uh, last couple of components of Image Manager because these really are the great advanced components, replication. Okay? We talked about that being a key to the first level of disaster recovery business continuity. Let's get that data off site. Okay? Replication can occur in a variety of ways, folks. Um, local replication or replication to, as you can see here, a destination of a local drive. A local drive is defined as either a locally attached USB disk, eSATA, Firewire, iSCSI um, is considered a, a local disk. Fiber channel would be considered a local disk. Or direct attached disk shelf storage, right? All local disk and we allow you to replicate to that disk completely free of charge. Okay. No additional sand, no issue. Yeah, yeah. As, as long, long as, as it is, is not, not an SMB, SMB share. share. If you're yeah, replicating, replicating to an SMB, SMB share on that, that SAN, SAN or NAS, NAS then, we, then would we would use our, our next form of replication, which would be a network drive. And we're just simply looking for an SMB share out on the LAN environment to replicate to. So local would mean locally attached drive letter, you know, and an iSCSI target or fiber channel target is presented as a local volume to Windows, so you can use it in that capacity, but if you're pointing to a, you know, slash slash server slash share, then that would be the network drive license that would occur. Now, we actually don't give you a way to procure by the network license right out of the gate um, or independently on its own. We're going to bundle it for free with the first of our off-site replication licenses. So our first off-site replication license and protocol is using FTP, or Standard File Transfer Protocol. We call it Intelligent FTP because we've built some intelligence into the replication model in that if you are replicating and we lose power or internet to that FTP server, when that power or internet or whatever connectivity is reestablished, we're going to look back to the source of the storage device or those backups. We're going to look to the destination and confirm where we left off in file replication and we're going to pick up from there. Okay? FTP replication, folks, can be really any kind of FTP server on the back end. We don't have any requirements for what this FTP server has to look like as long as it's communicating FTP. It could be something as simple as a NAS device with FTP turned on. It could be Windows running IIS and FTP. It could be an Ubuntu box running FileZilla. It could be an Apache server. We don't care what it is as long as it's an FTP server that has disk that we can write to. Okay? We support a secure FTP transmission or uh, connectivity into that FTP server by allowing you to apply an SSL certificate to the FTP server. 
or at least SSHing into the FTP server remotely. We do support a passive or active FTP mode, and again, here's where you would provide authentication into that FTP server with a username and password. The path of the FTP server, I typically recommend, keep it simple, you can just use an IP address, okay? But if you want to use fully qualified domain names here, you can absolutely do that, no problem. The next portion of our off-site replication, and really the last of our um, discussions for today when it comes to replication, ShadowStream. ShadowStream is a proprietary replication technology that StorageCraft wrote, and it's written across TCP and UDP, folks. So just by nature of protocol, it's going to be a bit more efficient than FTP, just because it doesn't have to do all the gets and puts. It's going to just be sending TCP packets across the Internet. Okay? However, the back end of that ShadowStream server is a bit more stringent in its requirements. We do want the, the ShadowStream server to be a Windows server class operating system. Doesn't have to be server class hardware, but server class operating system is a requirement. Um, in that server class operating system, we are going to install a ShadowStream console. The console has a very small footprint. It's about 20 megabytes in size, 25 megabytes in size. And once the console has been installed, you create the share and you create the username that we are going to replicate with. Okay? Um, ShadowStream does have a unique component available to it. We can compress and encrypt the actual replication data stream. Um, this actually comes, uh, comes very much in handy um, when, again, we're meeting some of those regulatory requirements where a lot of cases people want to see that data encrypted regardless of how it leaves the environment. So even if the backup itself is encrypted at 256 AES, there's many, many verticals out there that say, well, the backup's encrypted, but the data transmission or the replication stream is not. So you can encrypt that stream using ShadowStream and that encryption component. The limitation with encryption here is that it's 56-bit only. But again, um, I have actually been in, in um, uh, meetings with customers where um, that 56-bit encryption across the data stream coupled with the 256 encryption of the backup job meets those um, regulatory requirements for most verticals out there. Okay? Um, all of these encryption processes that we've talked about have what we call a replication mode that you can see here up across the, um, the um, tab and on the screen. It really allows us to define what it is we're going to replicate. What are you going to do? Are you going to replicate those original unconsolidated intradailies, those small 15, 30 minute, whatever increments? Um, you can do that by answering yes to this question. Are you replicating to a folder being consolidated by a second copy of Image Manager? So if we are replicating from a customer premise to a secondary location, and that secondary location we have the luxury of putting another copy of Image Manager then what we can do is replicate those unconsolidated files and allow Image Manager on the remote end to process the consolidation, retention, and verification for you. Okay? So now you can replicate the smallest, most bite-sized chunks of data that we create and allow the consolidation to happen off-prem, not on the production network, um, and, and you know, uh, control that not only with a, a separate location, but a completely disparate retention policy. Because all we're doing is taking the data and making a copy of it to a second location. So if we're retaining 10 years worth of data on premise, but off premise you only want to retain the last six months or the last year, you can do that and create disparate policies because you've got two separate copies of the chain and two separate instances of Image Manager running that consolidation and retention. Okay? Now this um, is going to allow for what we call a near real-time replication model. As a backup gets created, it gets verified. Within minutes, it's, it gets replicated. So if you're taking backups every 30 minutes, you're going to be replicating um, close to every 30 minutes as well. So we've also given you the option to still answer yes, there is a second copy of Image Manager over on the other side, but now wait for us to generate the consolidated daily file. So now it will wait until, all, until the end of the night and all the backups have completed when we run the, the consolidation process, and it will take the consolidated daily only, that one file, and send it to the other side. But again, we want Image Manager on the other side to do the weekly and monthly consolidation, so you are still answering yes to this question, 
and again we're assuming you've got image manager over on the other end if you don't have that luxury we don't have image manager on the other end it's a co-location facility it's the owner's home office it's just a big bunch of dumb storage it's jbod it's a nas device with no intelligence you can answer no to that question and you can replicate all of the consolidated files only again keeping that chain small and intact we're going to wait and send one file a day one file a week and one file a month okay if you wanted to replicate those original unconsolidated even in that environment you can do that by also checking that box and it will in turn replicate the entire chain and with the bottom box enabled files moved or deleted by image manager are deleted on the destination this is what will allow us to keep a mirrored retention policy so what the retention policy is on-prem with those two three options selected you see on the screen the mirror the policy will be mirrored at the replication target or at the destination okay so we're giving you the flexibility there to be able to keep the same have a completely disparate policy because if you're storing that in the location that maybe you don't own the equipment or as a co-location facility where you're paying for storage you might want to keep less storage there so you're not generating ongoing charges that keep growing and growing and growing by the amount of storage that you put on the other side okay so we want to help you be able to manage and regulate that as you see fit the last piece of image manager that I like to talk about and again one of our advanced components is what we call head start restore head start restore in turn folks allows us to do exactly what it's called generate a head start on that restore and how we do it is we create a lag time that we stay behind the production backup so that lag time is defined by hours or by days and we just stay behind the production backup when the backup occurs what that lag time is set at and let's just use one hour for today's um, conversation we the backup runs at 10 o'clock in the morning we wait until 11 o'clock and at 11 o'clock we take the last incremental and we hand it off to a building VMDK or VHD file so in turn we're creating a redundant copy of your server in either Hyper-V or VMware format that's automatically refreshed as the backups occur so it's what we call a near CDP solution continuous data protection for a fraction of the cost because we're creating redundant copies of your servers in hypervisor format, VMware or Hyper-V. Is that only being done in the cloud, or can that be on-prem? No, that's on-prem. And, you, and yeah. you have the ability right here, great question, to pick the destination of where that Head Start Restore job occurs. So if it's a VMDK, you can create another local wall. Again, something locally attached to the machine running image manager, uh, USB, eSATA, uh, Firewire, uh, iSCSI fiber channel okay as long as it's not an SMB share um, if it's an SMB share you're gonna just select a network drive and you're gonna point it out to that SMB share and we're gonna write the VHD or VMDK there but probably my favorite part about this is for um, those folks with uh, heavy VMware infrastructures and I know um, obviously GTC being a big VMware um, shop and environment this is something that plays right into the offerings that they provide is that we will allow you to create that VMDK on the fly down inside of the ESX environment. In other words, ESX and Virtual Center already know that there's a VMDK that's been provisioned in disk and ready to turn on as a new virtual machine in just minutes when you need it. Okay? As opposed to those Hyper-V environments, you would actually store it on either a local drive or a network drive and then either have to point Hyper-V to that SMB share or network drive when creating the virtual machine or move it into that Hyper-V shared storage environment in order to utilize it. Okay, So we have that deeper hook with VMware, again, allowing us to create that VMDK all the way down inside of the data store. Okay, um, all, all on the fly and all automatically being updated as we take backups. Okay. Um, that kind of concludes Image Manager for us today. Um, we're already a half an hour over, so I wanted to make sure we at least got into some of these advanced topics. Um, I, I, do, I am sensitive to time and, and uh, do want to make sure that 
Um, we, we also allow for any question and answer um, that might want to occur, or if any questions you guys have, I'd be happy to um, answer those for you. Yes? Just a quick one. Do you support online domain controller image backup? Online domain controller image backup. When you say online, you mean... Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, in a domain... So within an Active Directory environment, if you are a single domain controller only, if you do not have any redundant domain controllers in your network environment, excuse me, we're also going to recommend that you take a periodic Windows backup for the system state. If you have multiple domain controllers, then we don't recommend you do that because, of course, those roles can be transferred and seized by backup domain controllers in the event that that is a need. But for multi-domain controller environment, you can do at least one domain controller. A absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's not going to corrupt anything? No. no. What we don't allow for, though, is granular do domain active directory um, recovery. So we can't get into that domain controller backup and restore a user or an active directory object. So that's why we recommend grabbing that system state in a single domain controller environment. Okay. Uh, Commonwealth, um, right now, is on up to version 9. In OSI, version 9, I can't remember, I think it's 7. Will we run the online image, um, image backup with domain controller? Some of the critical services would would go go down at night. And then, uh, according to Microsoft, this is what we find out: um, they don't support image backup for domain controllers. Um, what they are likely talking about is again um, online backups of those domain controllers to be able to restore granular Active Directory objects. So if it is important for you to be able to reach into that backup and restore a user or restore an Active Directory object, that's where we're going to say that corresponding system state backup would occur. It is image backup. Um, they don't support, which is because we had that problem, then that's what we find out we found out that they don't. Um, I know that when we run the Oracle server image backup, of course, we have to use the freeze and thaw script to bias the database first. Right. So, but AD is AD database too, but, you know, waiting to do any bias script. So, we do agent backup, which allow us to do the granular database, yeah. database backup. Mm -hmm. So, we like to do um, the image backup just for the server in case the server crashes. Sure. So <clears throat> we are actually, the difference between, between us and Commvault, um, Commvault is dependent upon the Microsoft VSS architecture and engine, okay, for that image backup. We are not. So we're actually the only Microsoft certified VSS engine in the backup industry. So where other backup products will use the Microsoft VSS engine to quiesce that database, freeze it and thaw it, we are not reliant upon that. So if that domain controller comes back and says, I'm not really ready yet to take a backup, we'll issue another VSS um, pass at that domain controller. If it says it's not ready yet, we issue a third that uses both Microsoft and our certified engine. If that domain controller says it's still not ready, we make another three passes at it. So we will make up to six VSS passes or quiesques at that database for freeze and thaw where our competitive products will make one. And whether it's ready or not, it will proceed ahead and back up that image. So that's one of the reasons why, in many cases, um, those types of products don't allow for successful granular recovery of that domain controller, because it was using Microsoft's engine, and it wasn't able to capture that in a, in a clean state. Yeah, and, and you know, again, it, 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 the, the, the Remember, one, one of the, th of the things that we're doing is we're only grabbing those sectors. So our backups and that VSS free and freeze and thaw happens within milliseconds, as opposed to the competitive products, it takes much longer. Yeah, yeah. Does that help? Yes. Good, good, good. Okay. okay. Any other Any questions? questions? Um, I think that's okay. Did you have Did any you have questions, questions at all? At all? No? no? Okay, okay. Great. great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, that will conclude the webinar today.